Good evening, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, Marketing Specialist, and I'll be your moderator. We're excited to welcome Dr. John Kim as our speaker tonight, as he will provide strategies for managing the deficient ridge. Dr. Kim is a board-certified periodontist. Before we get started, we've got a few reminders for you. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll reply via email within two business days. And Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Dr. Kim, welcome and thanks for joining us. Good evening. I hope that you're doing well. I want to thank everyone from Henry Schein for this opportunity. I also want to thank you for attending today's webinar as I would like to share my experience over the years in treating the deficient ridge. As I was putting together this webinar, I just couldn't find a good way of condensing you know, all my years of experience into a four to five minute virtual lecture. Therefore, this will be a series broken up into two or three lectures that I hope you will enjoy. I thought that before I began, I would like to give a very brief introduction of who I am. Here I am with my family. Uh, my wife is also a dentist and I met her at UMC while I was doing my periodontal residency training. And uh, here are my two lovely boys who are uh, best friends and uh, worst enemies at times. And this is an older picture and we do miss these days that we used to travel. Here we were in Chicago. When I graduated from dental school, my father had a really emphasized for me to be a leader in the field, you know, not just be content with being in private practice and treating patients, but he wanted to, me to be more involved, more proactive with teaching and try to be, again, a leader in the field. And as I was becoming more active or proactive with teaching, I unfortunately had to take a hiatus due to my dad's health. Uh, so as I do with all of my lectures, I would like to dedicate this to my late father and also my baby girl, Chloe. Uh, she just passed away not too long ago. I grew up in Virginia and I graduated from the University of Virginia in 1999 with a BA in biology. Afterwards, I went to Harvard School of Dental Medicine and had a wonderful experience there. Following uh, HSDM, I did my periodontal residency at UNC at Chapel Hill under the guidance of Ray Williams, David Paquette, and the late Stephen Offenbacher. I've been in private practice for nearly two decades, and here's my amazing team. They are truly my family uh, away from home. And at Rocky Mountain Periodontal Implant Center, I practice with my good friend, Dr. Harriet Arrington, who is also a fellow UNC Perry alumni. You are very fortunate to have a dedicated team that goes above and beyond to help each other out and allowing for us to deliver high quality care for our patients, because that's what it's all about. By the end of today's talk, I'm hoping that you will have really have a better understanding of how I go about treating the deficient alveolar ridge. First off, it is very important to understand how to apply the value of information a CBCT scan gives us in treatment planning and also assessing results of a GVR procedures. I want to be very thorough in the few cases I showed today to make sure that you'll have a good basic understanding in my rationale for the surgical steps and the choices of biomaterials for predictable ridge augmentation. In the future, that is perhaps part two of the series or part three, uh, what I'd like to do is to apply what you learned today to a variety of simple and complex cases. I'll also talk about the challenges in GBR. As no therapy is guaranteed to be, be complication-free, I'll also share some of my cases that did not turn out ideal and attempt to explain what may have gone wrong so that hopefully you could avoid some of the hardships I've had to deal with. Times are changing and I'm showing my age here uh, as everything on the top are things that I have used in the past. And thankfully, I'm not still using. It's crazy to see how fast technology has advanced everything in life, including dentistry. And uh, with change, we always must be able to adapt. What is shown here, like the flat screen, the iPhone, the music streaming services have been big game changers in my life and probably yours as well. And what I am showing here is one of the biggest game changers in my private practice. It's right up there with me practicing IV conscious sedation. 
me using the piezo surgery just about every day. These are things that I can no longer practice without. Um, I've heard that about providers, per, some providers, practicing implant dentistry without a CBCT. And to me, that's mind blowing. I have a very simple rule in my office. That is, if you're not gonna take a CT scan, simple, no implant. I'm not gonna treat you unless I know that I can treat you safely. In every case that I'm showing, I use my CBCT machine. And hopefully you can see the importance and the value in the CBCT and especially with GBR procedures. I'm sure that you see this quite frequently. It looks very straightforward and it's not unreasonable to think that an immediate implant is possible. Or, and because look, an atraumatic extraction was done here. It was a flapless procedure. And you can see from the occlusal view, the patient looks to have a thick periodontal phenotype. We raise a flap and this is what we see now. Suddenly we are looking at a major GBR instead of a more straightforward site preservation or immediate implant procedure. This is what I see on a daily basis where cases are often complex. The defect here is very easy to outline. And what you see in the arrow is that there is an oral antral communication. You can appreciate from these views how extensive the defects are and that this suddenly requires the proper technique and right choice in biomaterials in order to regenerate bone. Today, this is what I'm going to focus my webinar on, cases you see on a daily basis, what my thought processes are, what to look for, what to avoid. I wanna make sure that hopefully by the end of tonight's talk, you'll be able to find my methods highly reproducible in your hands. I'm not doing anything special here. I'm not someone who's super special with my surgeries. Again, it's just, you know, practice makes perfect and you just gotta have uh, the right techniques and the right biomaterials to use to be more consistent in your setting. Beyond the wonders of how GBR can help our patients out, I found bone regeneration to be very personal. Uh, back in 2012, um, that's when my life really changed. I noticed some pain in my left scapula and numbness in my left fingertips. It got progressively worse. And I had pain again on my left fingertip and also my forearm. I was very fortunate not to have any motor deficiencies, but the pain was awful. Uh, I just dealt with it. I'm not a big believer in pain medication, so I just suffered through it. And I did not want to do anything uh, with surgery because of my fear of surgery. And also, I didn't want to miss work. So I proceeded with three years of physical therapy. And finally, in 2015, I had a foraminotomy done, which was with a posterior approach. One year later, in 2016, unfortunately, I had no resolution. I had my second cervical spine surgery. And uh, this time, instead of the posterior approach, they went in anteriorly. And uh, what they did was they did remove two discs that were putting pressure on my nerve at the C5, C6, C6, C7 level and replaced with artificial discs. Here you can see the end plates in place with the artificial disc in between. Um, it's a, from, I have a lot of friends that are orthopods and also neurosurgeons. And from what I heard, it's a very technique sensitive procedure, just like a lot of procedures we do in life. And uh, unfortunately, my artificial discs are off center. Uh, my symptoms never got better. And then the scary thing is that I'm beginning to have some osteolytic lesions in my spine. So prior to my third spinal surgery in 2019, uh, and this was to be a revision surgery to remove the hardware I had previously and convert it to a ACDF at two levels. This was a very scary moment for me, you know. Um, I felt like this is my livelihood at stake, and I began to wonder if I could continue my career as a periodontist. I, I began to wonder, you know, what type of life was I going to have moving forward? Um, you hear all those horror stories, and I was wondering, can I play tennis with my kids, my wife? Um, are my, my whole family going to be responsible for taking care of me the rest of my life? And uh, it was scary, but thankfully what I had was I had the world-famous Dr. Daniel Rue up in Columbia, New York go ahead and remove the artificial disc and the end plate, which you can see here, and uh, replace it with a bone graft, okay? 
A fusion was done, and here are my allografts that were infused with bone morphogenic protein in place uh, with a two-level fusion. Why do I share this? I think that, you know, I've been here, and I'm in my mid-40s, and, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, I felt invincible, and I really emphasize to you to have proper ergonomics, you know, and learn to pace yourself. It's very important. Don't overdo it. And uh, like many of my patients, I'm certainly hoping that this regenerative process is a smooth healing process for my spine. Various news outlets have reported a surge and increase in the number of fractured teeth. And I believe that this is very much true as our practice has been busier than ever amid the coronavirus pandemic. With so many teeth being extracted, guided bone regeneration is especially important in dental care. Beyond a higher incidence of fractured teeth, there is a recent study noting U.S. adults delaying dental care due to the pandemic. No surprise. What are my takes? And they are that number one, due to less dental care, we'll likely see more emergencies. That is, you're gonna probably have some more fractured teeth. Uh, number two, preserving the ridge becomes much more important. As more and more dental care is being delayed, there may be a longer gap between visits from when the site preservation was done and when the patient can finally maybe come back in for implant therapy. It has been pretty well documented over many studies that whether you site preserve or not, there's always gonna be bone remodeling that leads to a loss in bone volume. And there will almost always be a significantly higher loss in bone volume in areas that are not site preserved. You can tell most of the time without even having to ask, ask the patient whether or not a site preservation was done following the extraction. Just getting that clinical visual on the ridge will tell a lot itself. This is what we strive for in our GBR cases, our site preservation cases. Solid bone. You can appreciate the quality of the bone. It looks like natural bone without residual grafting material that never turned over. You can see a clear border of the osteotomy site and vital bone as indicated by the bleeding. In the black arrow, you can see remnants of the cross-link collagen membrane. This just goes to show that you can expect adequate time for the barrier membrane to stay intact to allow for cells with the osteogenic capability to populate the protected space and allow for the regenerative process to occur. When we can achieve good site preservation, the implant surgery becomes much simpler for me and therefore much simpler for the patient. My kids have already seen me present several times in various webinars, and this is obviously and understandably their favorite slide. Um, and what all these species have in common is the power of regeneration. While there are no known mammals that can really fully regenerate missing appendages, I find it quite fascinating us as clinicians to have the ability to regenerate bone. I would say that the predictability of regenerative therapy has played a huge role in the growth of implant therapy because if there is not adequate bone, how can one person place a dental implant? What is guided bone regeneration? What is GBR? Rather than reading the definition shown on the screen here, I'll simplify it into my own words. The idea here is that the bone grows very slowly while the overlying soft tissue grows much quicker. Sort of like the turtle and the hare. Think of the bone as the turtle and think as the soft tissue as the rabbit. So we need this cell exclusive physical barrier to prevent the soft tissue from growing into the defect. Not only that, but we need a way of maintaining the space below the membrane to allow for the regenerative process to take place. In order to achieve predictable regeneration, we do need to satisfy certain requirements. First off, we need a cell exclusive barrier membrane. Next, we need an adequate blood supply and the cells to allow for regeneration to occur. Sometimes uh, there's a big debate on whether or not there's a benefit to intramural cortical penetration. And uh, to me, I say, why not? It's not that hard to do. 
it's not too risky to do. And I always like to have that added blood supply. Space maintenance. We need to stabilize the blood clot to allow cells with osteogenic capability to populate the protected space. And you could be using tenting screws. You could use a membrane, the titanium mesh, bone grafts, et cetera. And stabilization, it's very important to stabilize and therefore immobilize the membrane. And this can involve the use of fixation screws, membrane tacks, and sutures, which I'll show plenty of today. Finally, wound coverage. Um, all of the above or all the aforementioned requirements don't matter much if you cannot manage the flap properly and if you cannot uh, with a tension-free advancement of the flap, get that primary closure. Because if you don't get that tension-free primary closure, you're gonna have a complication. And if you have a complication, it's gonna fail. And all the things I, again, mentioned before are not gonna matter as much. And finally, case selection. Not every case is indicated for GBR. Make sure that you're realistic with your expectations and what you're trying to achieve. Here are some common applications of GBR, and these are procedures that I do routinely in the office and probably what you do routinely as well. For one, extraction site preservation. Another is an immediate implant therapy. Also sinus augmentation. And you could have ridge augmentation, which is going to be the focus of this series. I'll be talking about a lot of these procedures with the exception of sinus augmentation. And Everyone has complications. You do enough of these procedures, you're bound to have one at some point. Therefore, I will briefly talk about how to manage complications with techniques, choosing the right biomaterials. Uh, however, this is going to be mainly the focus on part two or three of the series. Remember, you cannot have guided bone regeneration without having a barrier membrane. Several different types of cell exclusive barrier membranes are being used for GBR. Many of these non-resorbable membranes are composed of synthetic materials such as PTFE. These membranes can be outstanding with augmenting a deficient ridge as it is a more form-stable self-supporting membrane. But it does come with a higher complication rate. And we all dread those exposures as typically premature retrieval is needed due to subsequent bacterial contamination. Thankfully, we also have resorbable membranes. And as the name implies, these membranes resorb over time. And you do not have to worry about membrane retrieval. In general, resorbable membranes have been shown to have better soft tissue compatibility when compared to non-resorbable membranes. Amongst the resorbable membranes, they can be either cross-linked or non-cross-linked. Uh, Cross-linked membranes retain their integrity better and therefore provide a longer barrier function than the non-resorbable. It has also been shown that the resorption rate is dependent upon the degree of cross-linking. So when you are working with a resorbable collagen membrane, it's important for you to know the property of the membrane. That is, is this membrane cross-linked so I can have a longer barrier function, or is this membrane not cross-linked and therefore may resorb much quicker? And how does choosing the barrier membrane impact what bone graft I choose? We will get into this in tonight's webinar so that you can have a better understanding of guided bone regeneration to get more predictable results on a consistent basis. There are a variety of sources for bone grafts you got autogenous, and as the name implies, it comes from the same person. And this can be harvested intraorally or extraorally. As a periodontist, I've only harvested autogenous bone intraorally. You're not going to see me digging into someone's hip or skull to collect some bone for a procedure. Then you got the allograft, which is bone from someone else's cadaver. And this can come as mineralized or demineralized, and it can be cortical or cancellous depending on what property you want. Uh, that is, do you want something more dense or less dense, um, as this will affect turnover rate? And do you want something demineralized in hopes of having bone inductive components? You will also have, uh, you also have xenografts, which come from a different species, whether it's from the cow, the pig, a horse. 
Typically, you'll have slower resorption rates with the xenograft, and actually, some of the graft may never turn over. And finally, there are alloclasts, which I honestly don't use much of, except for when I'm doing a direct sinus lift with perhaps a calcium phosphosilicate. When looking at a bone graft, you must know the property of the bone graft. That is, is the bone graft osteogenic, osteoinductive, osteoconductive? With an osteogenic bone graft, you have the actual bone forming cells within the graft. With an osteoinductive graft, this graft has the ability to induce mesenchymal cells to differentiate into osteoblasts, the bone forming cells. The osteoconductive graft uh, does not directly contribute to new bone formation, but it serves as a scaffold for bone formation. Autogenous, as you can imagine, comes as a gold standard because it's osteogenic, osteoinductive, and osteoconductive. And uh, many of the allografts and xenografts are only osteoconductive, and the uh, allografts, some of them have the potential for having the osteoinductive property. Now that we've gone over the basic biologic concepts using bone graft and barrier membranes, let's talk about some important factors in treatment planning for GBRs, beginning with the host. Uh, it's, is this patient a heavy smoker as complication rates and smokers can be up to 50%? Uh, granted, this was a study done on sinus augmentation patients, but I think that we can all agree that smoking doesn't help as you can have more graft infections and wound dehiscences. Is this patient on a bisphosphonate that we have to take into consideration or perhaps consult the doctor with? Is this patient have a risk factor such as uncontrolled diabetes, which we all know leads to poor wound healing? We also have to look at what type of defect we are dealing with. Do we have a contained defect where we have all the bony walls present where it's easier to work with? Do we have a severely atrophic ridge that's much more different to work with and you have to uh, use different techniques and different materials and make sure you include autogenous? Or are we dealing with uh, grafting the dehiscence defect at the time of implant placement? It's also important to consider where we are working in the mandible, in the maxilla, where the bone density and vasculature is different. Is there enough keratinized tissue to work with? How shallow is the vestibular depth? Will there be a lot of muscle tension and a frenum that can affect primary closure? Can we perhaps take advantage of anatomy nearby, such as having that torus to hard saw out from and use that as an autogenous bone graft? And last but not least, compliance. To be honest, if I don't trust that the patient is going to be good and following the post-op instructions or do a good job with plaque control, I just don't feel good about putting them through a pretty involved and costly procedure. Before I go into my cases involving GBR, I want to show what I typically do on a routine basis. Here is a patient that lost number eight due to a fracture and has saved up to get an implant. She doesn't want a bridge. To me, this looks pretty straightforward as a patient has relatively good oral hygiene despite the calculus you can see in the mandibular anterior, there appears to be good keratinized tissue. Excuse me. But what concerns me to a certain degree is the prenal pool. And I always tell myself, and I tell you to do the same, is always begin with an end in mind. When I do a ridge augmentation procedure, will that prenum affect me in getting a passive intention free flap closure? I struggle with whether or not a phrenectomy is beneficial. In this case, I decided to do the phrenectomy using a combination of a scalpel and ND ag laser prior to the ridge augmentation. This patient healed well, but you can see the scarring present as expected. Before I go into any of my surgeries, I always think about the flap design. And I would like to review with you some of the common designs that I use. Um, some more than others. First, we've got the papillus bearing incision, which I do not do often as I like to keep my incision, in line, incision line away from the edge of the membrane or where I'm grafting, but I will strongly consider this choice when there are adjacent implants present so as to not disturb them. 
Next, you can have two vertical releasing incisions. Depending on the extent of the GBR, you should consider doing it, doing the uh, flap or the vertical incisions one to two teeth away from the graft site. The advantage with this is that you have better access. And if you're going to do periosteal stabilizing seizures with better access, this suddenly becomes so much easier to do. If you want to be more conservative, you can consider using the envelope flat design with no vertical incisions. This will allow for less disruption in the blood supply due to no vertical incisions, and you will have less scarring. However, in order to do this, you must extend the flap uh, to have a larger flap for adequate release and adequate access. This is what I do most often and what you'll see in most of my presentation is I feel like I get the best of both worlds of the two previous designs I just discussed. I feel like I have the better access while I also keep the flap design less invasive than I would if I had two vertical releasing incisions. In addition, if you are finding that you need to have more access or you need more release for the flap advancement, guess what? You could always add that second uh, vertical incision. Here is a vertical releasing incision at the distal facial line angle of number seven. When doing a larger ridge augmentation procedure, obtaining primary closure can be very challenging, even with great release. What you may need to do is manipulate the tissue along the vertical incision in order to get a clean closure. Here I am with my Orban instrument, and when you are working in the area of the papilla, make sure that it is partial thickness flap in that papilla to prevent the possibility of creating a black triangle. Now, as closure will be harder with a larger graft, uh, part of the original papilla, which I'm trying to show here outlined in that little white triangle, may need to shift mesially when you're um, closing everything up. And when you're doing this, as a papilla is uh, shifted mesially, you can now advance some of that keratinized tissue uh, coronally. And part of that may become the new papilla. Now, the old papilla has shifted mesially, and it's away from its original spot, obviously, and it's up to you. You can leave it there, okay, or you can excise it. And when doing all this, you must respect the mucogingival junction as it will be advanced. You do not want to advance the mucosal tissue into the papilla or the border of the tooth. It's important to maintain that resistant keratinized tissue to keep it bordering the tooth. Here we are with the full thickness uh, flap elevation. It's very critical to get all that soft tissue remnants removed. Leaving some behind may lead to compromised healing during the regeneration. After I feel like I have that bone pristine, I'll work on getting the flap adequately released to allow for tension-free closure. I'll begin with a 15 or 15 C blade and make a single uh, periosteal incision. Following, I will use uh, this instrument for blunt dissection along the incision line to make sure I get adequate release. And what you wanna do is, is get a good grasp of the flap with the tissue uh, forcep and pull coronally and stretch it as you do the blunt dissection. And um, I do get many of my uh, followers on Instagram asking me what this instrument is. And here's my pop culture reference. Believe it or not, it's called a mini me. I don't know if any of you have watched uh, Austin Powers and it's from long ago, I guess uh, when I was in my college days. But again, this mini me instrument is wonderful for my GBR procedures. Uh, and you can get it from your Henry Shine rep. I have an awesome one in Kate Shanahan, who I thank, thank you, Kate, uh, for everything you always do for me and getting me this instrument that I cannot practice with without on a daily basis. On the photo and on the video in the middle, you can see that I do not have adequate release. On the video in the far right, you can see that I'm beginning to get more release. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm getting uh, much closer. And what I'll do is 
that release more easily was tougher to get because I didn't have a second vertical incision. So what you can do is, is with your tunneling instruments, extend that to number 10. My preference is to have the site ready for closure prior to augmenting the area with the bone graft and barrier membrane. It is not as easy to get release, in my opinion, after you have the graft and membrane in place due to the bleeding you induce on the periosteal release, because when you do that release, you will get some bleeding, you'll get more bleeding. And uh, the graft and membrane, you know, begin to move as you're doing the release. So make sure you get the release before you put in the bone graft and the membrane. A big game changer for me has been using the sticky bone, IPRF. This really has been, uh, this really has improved the handling of the graft material. It makes it easier for me to place the graft onto the deficient site without having graft particles all over the place and uh, moving around, especially in the presence of someone who has more saliva or a patient that may have heavier bleeding. In this case, I had uh, the following in my graft, allograft and xenograft with uh, minced LPRF. Since 80% of the graft was Cancellus FBBA and 20% of the graft was uh, xenograft, I opted to use a cross-link collagen membrane that has a longer barrier function. I want a bone graft that will turn over, that is a Cancellus FBBA, which is less dense. I also want to provide some structural stability with the xenograft, which if you recall, can recall what I said earlier, has a very slow resorption time. And because I want to augment a deficient site, I prefer to overgraft, overbulk the area as I anticipate to lose some volume. With these larger ridge augs, it's really important to have a membrane with a larger barrier function. I'll hydrate this collagen membrane in saline or sterile water, and then I'll stabilize the membrane with resorbable sutures. After the membrane is in place, stabilized, I prefer to place a PRF over the membrane. And here you can see that. I'm gonna go over how I do my suturing. And I always begin with the horizontal mattress. It's really important, in my opinion, to have a wide bite when you do the horizontal mattress on the palatal. And this is very important to do with a wide bite if you're using non-resorbable sutures here. It's not as critical when you use resorbable sutures, but uh, this just makes it so that when you remove the sutures, if you choose to do so, it's gonna be easier to remove and you uh, snip from the palatal. Uh, the horizontal mattress helps minimize the tension at the flat margins, okay? And uh, therefore gives you a better chance of preventing the flap from opening or necrosing there due to having too much tension. I'll follow through my simple interrupted sutures at the edentulous site or where I did the graft. And then I'll go ahead and follow through with my simple interrupted sutures along the vertical incision. I like to do this last as I want to get the grafted area protected first. And like I showed you in uh, my previous slide, this is where you can manipulate the flap a little bit more with your suturing techniques to get good closure. Now, one thing I did learn in this case is that if I had to do this all over again, I don't know if I would have necessarily done the phrenectomy prior to the GBR. Um, I'll show you results of this someday, but it, as the phrenectomy before did not affect it. But when you do a phrenectomy beforehand, when I was getting the release in this case, it was just a little bit more challenging because of um, the scar tissue I created. So had I done this over again, probably I would have just done an internal phrenectomy at the time of the GBR procedure. Now that I went over how I do about 90% of my GBR cases, I do want to review various cases beginning with this one. And I'm going to share many different types of cases because uh, th this is what it's like in the real world. Often each case has a unique problem and or presentation and therefore merits a unique solution. In this case, this lady had number nine extracted uh, one week before she saw me for an emergency exam. Beyond the current pain and infection present, this case presented to be especially challenging as she was upset for not being thoroughly informed. In light of the pandemic, uh, especially right when we reopened from the pandemic, this is what I would be seeing almost every day. Like I showed in my, the previous slide, this is what I'll typically do. I'll have one vertical releasing incision, and this is my incision design. 
And I will begin with a single and shallow periosteal release using my 15 or 15 C blade. It's important to extend that periosteal releasing incision laterally and in my opinion, beyond a vertical incision. And as I showed you, I'll bring out my awesome powers instrument, the mini me, and I will do my blunt dissection to stretch the flap and get that release. I'll go ahead and I'll use my spoon curette. And following that, if needed, I will use my furrication file to go ahead. It's a Hirschfield to further clean out the defect. We want this to be clean as possible, free of any soft tissue remnants. And if need be, I'll go ahead and use my piezo tone. Whether I'm working in the maxilla or the mandible, I do have a preference with intramural penetrations to induce some bleeding. I'll go ahead with a layered approach, as Danny Buser has talked about in the past. And in this case, I went with about an 80% allograft, which is more um, into the socket and I covered it with a layer of 20% xenograft. I went ahead and used a native non-cross-linked collagen membrane here as it is pretty well documented that these membranes have been shown to have better soft tissue compatibility when compared to the non-resorbable membranes. Uh, this membrane has excellent hydrophilicity that promotes its adhesion to the graft and the surrounding native bone. And in my opinion, it's very easy to work with. Uh, while this membrane while this membrane can be stabilized with tacks or fixation screws, whatever you prefer, I did not feel the need for it in this case. And the last case I showed, I use a cross-link collagen membrane that lasts longer, whereas in this case, I'm using a barrier membrane that resorbs more quickly. Urban and colleagues did a study comparing the bone gain in barrier membranes with four to six months of resorption time versus barrier membranes uh, with about six weeks of resorption time. And what they found was that there was no difference in the amount of bone gain achieved between the two different membranes. It appears that this membrane may only be necessary for the initial weeks of healing. Uh, but just to be safe, what I did here was I layered the slowly resorbing xenograft over the allograft that has a faster turnover rate. And I hope that this makes sense and that you think about these things, these properties in the membrane, the bone graft, as you do each case. I'm a creature habit when it comes to suturing. So this is going to look like what I showed you earlier with my horizontal mattress sutures. And again, this really helps in minimizing the flap tension at the edges. I'll again go with my simple interrupted uh, sutures mid-crestally. And finally, I'll finish with my simple interrupted sutures and to get that vertical incision closed. Six months out, the healing looks great. The patient's very happy with her fiddler, flipper, but obviously I want a more permanent solution for her. The corresponding CBCT shows adequate ridge dimensions to accommodate a future dental implant. And on the 3D rendering here, you can see on the left, you can clearly see a bulk of bone where there was a formerly a large dehiscence lesion. This is where we began on the day I saw the patient for the emergency exam and treatment. And I thank uh, my team for working through lunch so that we could immediately help this lady out. And this is where we are at the time of reentry, which is quite a contrast from the initial presentation. We went from having a large defect to now having good mature bone for implant placement at the number nine area. Went forward with my osteotomy in an attempt to get the implant in the ideal restorative position. And I did not use a cover screw here on purpose. Why? I know it may be a long shot, but I wanted to see if I can do some further soft tissue augmentation in hopes of getting more of the papilla back. So I use a smaller healing abutment that would gonna just provide some additional height of support for the soft tissue graft. This is one of my favorite procedures to do in the office, uh, the VIP connected tissue graft. And um, here, not only did I get tissue from, let's see if it clicks, from the, the uh, 10 through 14 area, but I also harvested some from the palatal of number eight. 
And I, it was almost like a double uh, VIP connected tissue graft because I want to see how much more I could bulk this. Uh, quite often, what I'll do is I'll uh, secure my connected tissue graft with a few 6O chromic gut sutures uh, with horizontal compression and also tack it down apically with some simple interrupted sutures. On top of that, I'll go ahead and press uh, place a PRF and then try my best to get uh, tension free primary closure. Here is the patient with and without her flipper. I gave it my best, and this is as much as I can get for the papilla. And uh, if you know Tarnow's uh, study pretty well uh, in relation with how much of that black triangle can fill in relative to the uh, interdental bone, it's, this is as good as we're gonna get. And so the patient got number nine uh, restored, and eight is going to have a new crown in hopes of making that black triangle less noticeable. Um, I wish that both were crowned at the same time with temporaries. Um, thankfully, this patient has a lower lip line and the best way to maybe have avoided this to begin with would have been to have had that opportunity and place that immediate implant if it's, if it's doable with a provisional crown or a customized healing abutment to provide that papilla some soft tissue support. On to a new case. In my earlier days, I would quite often use a titanium reinforced membrane. And this is a case in which a severely deficient knife edge ridge was successfully augmented with a titanium reinforced membrane. When there are no complications, this membrane can really aid in regenerating great quality bone. There's simply no arguing that. As often as I can, I prefer to take a CBCT with a radiograph extent. This helps me determine if a GVR is needed, and if so, how much ridge augmentation is needed, as this will affect my decision-making process and my choice of biomaterials. I do want to get more involved in the digital world, our digital workflow, but still up to today, I, when I make a stent, I will usually just use a suck down. I like this as surgery is not as difficult. You don't have, you don't, necessarily dull your drills as quickly as there's no metal sleeve that your osteotomy drill is hitting. And finally, I feel like I get better irrigation during the osteotomy, which I find to be very important. So what I've learned is that radiographic stents allow for you to, uh, to give yourself, the patient and dentist, a good idea of how involved a ridge augmentation may be and how long the healing period will be. And in my experience, I have had better results uh, when going with sleeveless with my stents. And I think, again, like I said earlier, that had to do a lot with um, the lack of adequate irrigation with that metal sleeve. Here is a more complex GBR case in which this young patient would like to have her tooth back after losing the tooth due to root resorption. The tooth was extracted and side preserved, but there was still inadequate bone for a dental implant. Clinically, it is apparent that there is a horizontal and vertical ridge deficiency. When treatment planning for these cases, it's very important to consider the area you are working on. The mandibular anterior, uh, for me, is particularly tough because of the strong tension uh, present there. You also have to consider the relative lack of keratinized tissue and also the frenal pool. The CBCT here verifies the bone deficiency, that the bone deficiency is present. In the mandibular anterior, you are likely going to have to go with a narrow three millimeter diameter implant. If you want stability for the implant over time, uh, and especially in this especially young patient, it's ideal to have at least two millimeters of bone facial and two millimeters of bone lingual to the implant. Therefore, if you're going to place a three millimeter diameter implant, you're going to have to have at least a six to seven millimeters of bone width uh, to give this predictability over time, in my opinion. Upon flap access, you can see the horizontal and vertical nature of the defect. Knowing that this is a tougher area to work on, it is safer to have a larger flap access so that you are at least two teeth away from where you plan to do the major grafting in this augmentation. Having larger flap access uh, will also allow for an easier access to harvest some autogenous cortical bone. Being in a mandible where the bone is more dense and there's less vasculature, I find it more critical to do the intramural cortical penetrations. 
Just be careful of the adjacent roots. Also, you have to have the right ingredients for a tasty, you know, as you have, when, let me rephrase this, as you have to have the right ingredients for a tasty cocktail, you have to have the right biomaterials for a successful GBR, hence the ideal ingredients for my clinical cocktail. For larger deficiencies, it is absolutely important to have some autogenous. I also incorporated some xenograft here as I would like to have a bone graft with a slower turnover rate to provide some structural stability during the healing period. I had about a one-to-one -one ratio and you can mix, you can either mix the grafts or you can do a layered approach uh, that Dr. Buser has shown in the past. It's also known as a sandwich approach. The mandibular anterior can be an area where there is a lot of trauma from the tongue and food and other things. Um, there is also a very strong tension here due to the musculature, which is why I chose to use a form-stable, self-supporting titanium reinforced membrane. Using this membrane is really not for beginners, as it is very technique sensitive and hard to use. This membrane must be stabilized with tacking pins or a fixation screws. Access to the lingual stabilization is very tough and only can be done with an implant handpiece. You can't do it with your hand instrumentation. The native non-crosslink collagen membrane was draped over the titanium reinforced membrane. Uh, I wanted this additional protection in preventing the unwanted premature membrane exposure. In addition, this allows for some more cell exclusivity and covering some more of the bone graft that was not fully covered by the PTFE membrane, as it's critical to make sure that the non-resorbable membrane is trimmed so that it is at least a few millimeters away from the root surface, so you do not impede with the soft tissue healing, okay? So with the resorbable membrane, the proximity of it to its root surface is not as critical. Uh, at the same time, I chose this biomaterial as I did not want to suffocate the graft, which is why a faster resorbing collagen membrane was used. So we have great healing postoperatively uh, with all the sutures uh, removed by week four. At week six, we are near full he uh, Sorry, at six months out, we are near full healing, but we're not quite there yet. As I did a vertical ridge arc, I want to wait a longer time. The six month CBCT shows good bone. We now have adequate horizontal and vertical dimension of bone to allow for a placement of an implant. Though this bone looks great on the CT scan, it's important to know that good bone on the radiograph does not necessarily equate to good bone clinically. Uh, being that this is a vertical ridge augmentation, like I said earlier, I want think it's very important to wait at least you know eight to nine months for reentry. Allow that bone to mature, and then proceed with the implant procedure. This CT scan is also very helpful in showing you where all the fixation screws are, or give you a reminder where they are, so that it makes retrieval easier. Reentry re was done about nine months out. The disadvantage of using a non-resorbable membrane is that it is fixated. It is that larger uh, flap access that that larger flap access is actually required uh, when you do this because you have to remove all that hardware. I would advise uh, taking good pics during the GBR procedure. Again, in addition to the CT scan, you have more information right there to know exactly where you have them because sometimes they're not that easy to find. And so in removing the lingual, just like as you're trying to put in that uh, lingual uh, fixation screw, you're going to have to retrieve it using a handpiece. And here you see it being retrieved. Now, you got to be very careful in removing the barrier membrane and make sure that all the fixation screws are removed. Here you only see three, though I had four placed. These are really small fixation screws and one of them did get suctioned, but make sure you keep count. With the membrane removed, I'm really happy with the outcome of this GBR. Not only do we have uh, adequate bone volume, but you can see here that the bone quality looks excellent. 
as a in the after the reentry portion of it and removing that membrane, I place a 2.9 millimeter diameter tapered implant, and you can appreciate here a two millimeter buccal shelf of bone and nearly a two millimeter lingual shelf of bone. The implant's in the ideal restorative position to allow for my res referring dentist to have a chance in restoring this implant with a screw retain restoration. After seeing the result from the last case, who wouldn't want to do it this way every time? But there is a good reason why I rarely use titanium reinforced membrane nowadays and only on select cases. I know that studies have shown these membranes that have a higher complication rate. And uh, though I can have some amazing results with these membranes, um, it's really traumatic to deal with these type of complications for me and the patient. And having a 30% complication rate is just not acceptable in my private practice setting. Complications are very tough situations to deal with as you lose the confidence from your patients, your dentists, and understandably, you know, doubt begins to creep into my mind here. Here's my last case for today's what tonight's webinar. And this case illustrates what I do more often nowadays. Here's a case in which an 88-year-old patient was referred to me due to not being able to chew and drooling more. She unfortunately lost her bridge last year and due to her decreased chewing efficiency, she has lost some weight in the process. You can see here that the ridge is quite thin and in order to place an implant in the ideal restorative position, we'll go ahead, we're gonna need to go ahead and augment uh, the buckle of number 19 and number 20. One of the most important things to do with surgeries on this area is to first and foremost, locate that mental foramen, okay? And this is something that you should have a good idea of where it is based on the CBCT scan beforehand. In the mandibular arch where the bone is more dense, I do prefer to do intramural penetration. So here you see me after I do the decortication to get that blood supply. You can see in the phone on the far right, that the oozing occurs, and this happens literally seconds after you go ahead and decorticate. And here's a little video on it and showing how fast that bone will bleed after a decortication. When doing a larger GBR, I do prefer to include autogenous as it's a gold standard because of it being osteogenic, osteoconductive, and osteoinductive. I use about a 50-50 mixture of an autograft and a xenograft. I went with the layered approach uh, with the autogenous against the defect and the xenograft over it. Why the xenograft? I wanted a bone graft with a slower turnover rate as I was using a native cross-linked collagen membrane that has a faster resorption time. I understand why some people do not like the low turnover rate with the xenografts, but I will say that it has, well, very well for me, and it has been validated with many studies. With the slow resorption, this can help keep the volume of that graft stable during the healing or during the regeneration. When I use a collagen membrane with a faster resorption rate, as I mentioned earlier, my preference is to have it layered. Working in the posterior and then this patient has limited, a more limited opening can be very tough which is why I chose this barrier membrane. For me, it, it just handles very well. And when it handles very well, guess what? It's easier for me to use. And I was able to easily adapt this over the bone graft. And also you want to have some of that membrane adapted against the native bone as well. The hardest part of the procedure was stabilizing the membrane with the periosteal sutures. I had two running horizontally and four vertically. Finally, I made sure that I had good release from the facial and the lingual to get a tension-free primary closure. Here is the eight-month post-op CBCT, and it appears that, that we have a good buccal lingual dimension of bone. Clinically, I am very happy with what I see. Yes, there are some residual xenografts, and that was to be expected. They have a slow turnover rate, and sometimes it never turned over. I used my heart soul back action to go ahead and remove the excess. And then I proceeded with the osteotomy. And what I like to see is good vital bone as indicated by the bleeding from the osteotomy site. 
and you can appreciate the difference in the bone we have present before with the defect and after the GBR procedure. Though this native collagen membrane does resorb faster, it does have good tissue integration and early vascularization from the periosteal slide. And vascularization is a prerequisite for bone formation and may be one of the most important qualities of these biocompatible membranes. Urban and colleagues have shown in some studies that the resorption time may not be of primary importance for GBR and that this membrane is necessary, like I said earlier, maybe only for the initial weeks of healing. These posterior ridge augmentations can be very tough for me. And what I've learned is that sometimes I need to use a barrier membrane that handles well in my hands to make sure the procedure goes well. Because guess what? If the procedure's not done well, it doesn't matter what you use. It's gonna, you're gonna have a complication and it's gonna fail. Uh, it's important to note, one has to be very mindful of getting that tension-free primary closure. As it, has, as it has been demonstrated that no remnant of an exposed native collagen membrane exists after one week of healing in a study done by Melanig and colleagues. As I'm nearing the end of tonight's webinar, I briefly wanted to touch upon how I have evolved with my GBR techniques over the years as a prelude to the next part in this series. For one, I don't do bar graphs that often, whether it's from an, uh, whether it's aloe or auto. I'm trying to be less invasive and to be quite honest, these procedures take a lot more time, which is not good for my neck. Uh, plus there's a good chance that the cortical plate, part of that bone graft remains dead bone and never turns over, almost like a xenograft at times. And so sometimes you begin to worry, when is that sequester of bone maybe gonna work itself out? I also um, noticed that in my career, the less hardware I place, the lesser chance I have a complication. Also, retrieval of these uh, components can be challenging and you need to have a larger flap entry or flap access for re-entry. I've not been using as many titanium reinforced membranes. I do still use it, but just not as often. As I've been getting very predictable results with less complications using resorbable membrane using the right technique. And although I, again, love the PTFE, the titanium reinforced membranes, I'm just trying to, at this stage of my career, do everything I can to minimize my chances of a complication. Lately, I've been incorporating the STL data from my intraoral scanner with the DICOM data from my CBCT. Um, I actually did this case just today. Uh, and what this did was by using technology here, we were able to save this patient a lot of cost from a more costly GBR procedure. And we we're, able, we we're able to make this procedure less invasive. And so I can't wait till I show this in the future part of my webinar. And finally, I'm pretty much incorporating PRF into all my ridge augmentation procedures. In the past, I was using PRP for all my major GBR cases. And from what I've read, the literature appears to be divided on both. Back then, when I was using PRP, I was not using it to expect a better outcome in my procedures. Instead, I truly enjoyed how much it improved the handling property of my graft. It made my surgeries easier to do, and therefore it reduced the surgery time. Reduced surgery time makes it easier on the patient to handle postoperatively. And the same goes for PRF, except with the added benefit of it being of an autogenous source. I wanna put this all together. Gotta to have a thorough exam as it is needed to evaluate the defect clinically and on the CBCT to figure out what potential challenges one may encounter. Must be careful with your case selection. That is, is this patient a smoker? Does this patient have a bad potential for healing as they're an uncontrolled diabetic? You know, once uh, you've uh, done a thorough clinical exam, you could go ahead and treatment plan. Okay, you got to see, is this a good case for GBR? And uh, when you say yes to that, you could begin to think, how will you approach this case? You know, what biomaterials will you use and why? What will be your graphs you use? And in what proportions will you use them in? 
what will be your incision design to help minimize that complication and also allow you to have good access? You also must be methodical. In order to be consistently predictable with your GBRs, you must pay attention to detail. You must understand the indication of the GBR procedure and uh, what would work best and why. Understand the scientific studies behind the biomaterials uh, you choose to use. So when you know how to properly uh, use these products with a systematic approach, there should be no reason to, uh, for you not to be able to achieve predictable GBR on a consistent basis. And last, last but not least, know your limits. You know, complex GBR procedures are not easy, and each step along the way must be executed perfectly in order to minimize the chance of a complication or failure. You know, take time to master your craft in treating your patients. Take a lot of picture, learn from them, and don't hesitate to get help and make those referrals when needed. You know, our goal is, our ultimate goal is to deliver the best patient care we can. I'd like to close with this quote here. It's pretty simple. Knowledge is power and knowledge shared is power multiply. I love what Henry Schein is doing. Every day as I scroll through my emails, I see many emails from Henry Schein offering these free webinars, and I find that to be fantastic, you know, to provide a platform in which the leaders in their respective fields can share their knowledge and their experience in order to help others. We're all in this together for the greater good of doing what's best for our patients. I often share my cases on Instagram, so I hope you could uh, feel free to follow me there and watch. I'm very active on stories, more so in stories than with posts, but I do take I do post stories on a daily basis, and I hope you find that to be something that would help you in your setting. Um, part of those posts go on to Facebook as well, which I'm not on as often and trying to be better about. I'm never on Twitter, really. And um, my email is here as well. I think for those that know me well uh, through social media know that I'm very accessible. DM me anytime with any questions you have. Call me. I, I'm pretty free about giving my cell phone and, or, uh, or go ahead and email me. And uh, thank you, Henry Sean, for having me. It was an honor to do this. And um, with the contacts I just have listed, please go ahead and send me those questions and I'll answer you as soon as I can. And again, I, I just have to thank Henry Shine again for this opportunity. It's always an honor to have the opportunity to be able to share my experience. I always find it a privilege to, um, again, share what I have learned in my private practice setting with others. And I hope that someday beyond doing all these virtual lectures that I can be doing, getting back to doing these live lectures. Everyone stay safe, enjoy the weekend, and I'll see you later. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for your time this evening. If anyone has additional questions about this topic, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. Additionally, if anyone is interested in attending future Henry Shine webinars, visit henryshinedental.com slash webinars for our upcoming schedule. As a thank you for attending, everyone will receive the recording of this webinar via email sometime in the next week. I'd like to thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you back here on future webinars.